Please pray with me. Almighty God, as you have ordered everything according to your will and your ways, so, Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would order us according to your will and your ways. Because you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, set before our eyes once again your good and gracious will, your law, your decrees, your precepts, your commands, so that seeing the faithfulness of your word through your Son, Jesus Christ, we might delight in your ways and know your will all our days. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Samuel Clements, Mark Twain to most of us, had a little bit of a fascination with death. Partly because he saw so much of it. Uh, at least three of his siblings uh, died before they ever reached adulthood. Uh, one of his brothers, one of his very good friends in life, was tragically killed in a riverboat accident on the Mississippi. And his wife, actually, was sick to the brink of death, he says, and, and actually he, he later calls what happened to her when she came back from that a miracle. It was the only way that he could describe what happened. He also had a fascination with religion. Uh, he opines greatly about religion. We're not quite sure where he stood on different things. He certainly looked around at society and saw the hypocrisy of those who called themselves religious, even Christian. Where he stood, we don't exactly know, but he spent much ink and much energy speaking about religion in one form or another. In the autobiography of Mark Twain that was by his request published after his death, the two actually collide, his fascination with death and his, his constant connection with religion. One of the other things that he grappled with, with death, was that he says in that autobiography that he saw a man shot in the street who died there before his very eyes. And he says it haunted him for a long time. So much so that he started to have dreams about it. Only in the dreams, what happened was somebody, as this man lay dying in the street, came and placed a Bible on his chest. And here's where we don't know whether Samuel Clements, Mark Twain, was actually talking about his own experience or once again trying to speak and metaphorically about religion. He says, I struggled to gasp for breath for many a night under the weight of that vast book. He doesn't say it, but he almost says, or he almost depicts this as if he starts to be that dying man in the street and, and the Bible which now lays upon his chest is the thing that is keeping him from breathing. It's stopping him from living to some extent. Now, when we think about the Word of God, we, we might not think that way about it. We might not think that it's some, some weight, some burden that is upon us. And yet, if we're going to be honest, and after all, this is a series about honest repentance, then there's part of us that can empathize with Samuel Clements. There's part of us, whether we realize it or not, that does see the Word of God as a burden. Maybe not so much the Gospel, but certainly what we would call the law. Do this. Don't do that. Be here. Go there. Make sure you're paying attention to these things. That, that burden comes to us. That, that weight of God's law presses down upon us. We struggle with it. 
In our sinful nature, in our fallenness, we, we struggle, maybe not against under the weight of a vast book, but definitely against the laws of God. I don't think there's a one of us in here that has read their scriptures and not come up against something in there that we don't struggle with. Why would God do it that way? What's God thinking when he tells us to do this? Boy, these are hard lessons to learn. These are hard teachings to grapple with. That's the law of God upon us. But it's only the law of God upon a sinful and fallen creation. Because the law of God has actually always been there, and the law of God is what actually makes all of this possible. Because the law of God as we hear it, do this, don't do that, well, that same voice of God with the same authority is the one who said, let there be light. And there was. The law of God spoke. And so it happened. It's that same law of God who separates the waters under the expanse from the waters that are above the expanse and keeps them in place. It is by the law of God that it was so. It's the law of God that says, water's here, dry land here. And never the, pardon the pun, twain shall meet. It is the law of God that creates that space. And in fact, later on, when God is talking to Job at the very end of the book of Job, and he gets to Question Job now for a moment. He says, Where were you when I said to the waters, Thus far you shall come, and no further? It's actually the law of God that created this space we call creation and put everything in its proper place within there. And within that, that framework, within that design, within that law of God, he stuck humanity. And so, the irony of it is, is, as now we see God's law as a great burden, God's law was originally in intended to be that in which we thrive. That in which we dwell securely. That in which we find the blessing of God. But sin reared its ugly head. And it made us start to question the law of God. Did God really say? And all of a sudden, those boundaries, those boundaries look, look like barriers. Those, those boundaries start to look like that which is confining us and oppressing us, not, not letting us out and live and be free. And so we start to attack those boundaries. It's as if God built us this perfect little house and he said, in here you will find everything you need. In here you will dwell securely. In here you will thrive. And we looked around and we said, well, I don't like where that wall is. And we took a sledgehammer to it. And, and I don't like the fact that I can't get the, the breeze blowing through my kitchen. And so we smashed the window out wait, why is it wet in my kitchen now? Why is the rain coming in? And pretty soon we find other walls that we don't like. We find other barriers in our way and we start smashing through them and pretty soon, before we know it, the roof comes crashing down on us. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in the very same place where Samuel Clements was and the law of God is there crushing us destroying us. That which God created to be good and right and proper and a blessing to us, we shattered and made it death to us. 
And now we, like Samuel Clements, struggle to breathe under the weight of that vast law of God. And in our final breaths, we think about all that our God created. All that was exactly the way that it was supposed to be. And we long to go back there. We, we long to return to that security and to that goodness. And so we cry out to our God. God, take this burden away. But he doesn't. He can't. It's the law of God. It's that which defines what is good, what is right, what is purposeful. He can't take it away. But what he can do is renew you in the midst of it. And so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, as one who is under the law, to redeem those under the law. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, starts to wade through all of that rubble, starts to get battered and bruised by struggling with all of the sinfulness that we've created and left in our wake. And in his dying breath, with his last effort, as wounds appear on his hands and his feet, as we see the weight of sin start to overcome him, he reaches you in the midst of that rubble. He finds you under that burden. And you would think in that moment that we'd be a little perturbed at God. Because what you would expect God to do is to recreate creation for us. Start at the very beginning. Put all of the pieces back in place so that we have a place to live. But God doesn't always see things our way. And so instead, He starts to redeem His creation backwards. Because as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, struggling under the same weight and burden of that, that sin and the struggle with the law that we now have, and having found you, he breathes his last breath and gives it over to you. He takes all the strength that he has, all of the energy and effort that he had in order to get there, and he passes it over to you. And so now, even as you struggle under the burden and the weight of that law of God, you now don't do so under your own energy, by your own authority, according to your own strength. You are now able, able to breathe under the law of God by the Spirit of God that He breathes back in you through your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there, under the weight of that law where we find ourselves, there our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is with us. Only because of His perfect obedience, only because He knows the plan fully, He restores life to the system. Starting backwards starting with you. And as he brings you back to life in the midst of that rubble, he shows you again his law, his goodness. And he gives each and every one of us the opportunity to start putting his creation back in place. To start the restoration process that began in us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to continue it into the world around us. Because now he's given us the opportunity to go to our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, everybody who also struggles under the weight of that vast and arduous law of God and gives us the opportunity to breathe life back into them through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
because it is by the same decree of our God, with the same power and authority that said, let there be light, and so it was, that says to you now, by the blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Receive the Holy Spirit. Come alive. And so we do. Not separated from the law of God. Not free from the law of God. But still under that law of God. Only this time with the life and breath of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But that means, to be honest, that the law is still a burden to us. It's still something we struggle with because the work of redemption is still happening. It, it, it's still something we fight against, not to knock down a few more walls and see where it leaves us, but maybe we know better this time. Of course, if we don't, thanks be to God that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be right there for you in the midst of the rubble. But now, even as faithful followers of our Lord and Savior, even as those who now delight in the law of God, we still struggle with it. But this time we do so in the same way that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did when he sought to bring God's truth and God's will into this world as he sought to restore God's fallen creation one pitiful sinner at a time. He was mocked for it. He was scandalized for it. He, he was disavowed for it. He was ultimately killed for it. All because he was seeking to bring the law of God to bear on his creation. And now as we join with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in that work of redemption, we share his burden. We too, as we seek to bring the law and the will of God into our world, will find ourselves fighting against the fallen nature. Find ourselves fighting against sinfulness. Find ourselves clawing tooth and nail through the rubble trying to find some way of making sense to it and helping to put the pieces back together. It's the burden we now bear. But now you don't do it alone. And now you don't do it because you're fighting against it. Now you do it because you're walking with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And honestly, you're not even doing it. It's the breath and life and strength and obedience and righteousness of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that now makes you a restored child of God. Now makes you part of that redemption story. Now makes you one who puts the pieces back together little by little, inch by inch, day by day. Until that day through all his work, through all of us, through all of his saints throughout time and space, and through the unknowable and unsearchable wisdom of our God, we'll find ourselves back in a restored creation. Back within the confines of our God's perfect law back where we belong, back under his blessing and under his care, back, back relying on his daily provision, back in his presence for all of time, back within those boundaries that he created for us to thrive in. And until that day comes, he gives us His law fulfilled. He gives us His law fulfilled in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He gives us perfect obedience. 
He gives us holiness. He gives us everything that we could ever desire. Not through us keeping the law, but through the law of God. The very Word of God. Your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming to you ever and always to breathe back into you life even under the weight of that vast book. Amen. And now because your pastor wasn't sure whether I would get to the gospel in my sermon, we sing the hymn, The Gospel Shows the Father's Grace. <laughs>